my name is Tatenda, uh, but I go by Tintin, which is a lovely, uh, ironic nickname that I was given by my rugby buddies when I first moved to, uh, to Glasgow. Um, been living in Glasgow since 2004, so moved from Zimbabwe there, straight from Zimbabwe to Glasgow, which was interesting to say the least. But now I like haggis and I like black pudding, so I think I've, I fit in pretty well. So my name is Ollie. I live in Glasgow in Scotland. Um, I'm involved in a lot of glass, grassroots activism in Glasgow um, and I also consider myself to be a writer. I'm Raj. Um, I'm the current Vice President Diversity in uh, Strathclyde Students' Union and uh, recently elected the President for the coming year and also the uh, International Students' Officer for Scotland. My name is James Hiwatari and uh, I'm a writer and a musician wannabe. I'm Jenny Kamrad, I'm a writer of journalism, copywriting, all kinds of things. And I also uh, chair the charity Transmedia Watch. I am Radul Wadwa and I uh, work for a couple of violence against women charities. So I work for Shakti Women's Aid, uh, which works with black minority ethnic women who experience domestic abuse, where I deliver training uh, for them. And I also work for Rape Crisis Scotland. Uh, I'm the training and volunteer coordinator there. I, my name is Ajamu. I'm an artist and an activist. I'm, I've been involved with I'm, LGBT work for about 20 years. I'm also I'm, I'm a son, a nephew, great uncle, a lover. My name is Jack. I am a cisgendered woman. I am also a gay woman and I also have a disease called retinitis pigmentosa um, which affects my eyesight so I'm registered blind. The intersectional identities, I suppose I'm a trans um, Indian woman of Iranian uh, Pakistani heritage who has a mixed faith, so I'm also Hindu Zoroastrian, so quite a lot. Well, I'm a woman, despite what other people think, we'll say. <laughs> um, black, disabled, and I'm a former sports player as well. I'm from Brazil. I live in Glasgow for about nine years. Uh, I'm identified as bisexual and I'm also a trans guy. Now, my uh, parents were born and raised in Jamaica. I was born in the north of the country, so basically I see myself very much as a northerner. I am I I'm identified as queer, and, and I, what I mean by queer is that kind of not I'm necessarily around my kind of identity. I'm, I'm, I'm queer, it's kind of more around my um, politic, around one's identity. I, I practice Buddhism. My identities that I consider to be intersectional, especially within discrimination in services, um, is being queer, being non-binary trans, being uh, physically disabled, as well as mentally ill and autistic. I'm an international student. I was uh, born and bred in Malaysia. And uh, I'm also from a mixed background. My mum's uh, Filipino. Um, my dad is uh, Sri Lankan. And uh, that gives some interesting conversations as well within the family. Also a disabled person, recently disabled. Um, I lost my arm in May 2009 uh, in a car accident. Well, I'm disabled. Uh, I have a chronic illness and I'm severely disabled. Um, I'm intersex, um, I'm non-binary and um, I'm bisexual or queer in various ways. These things may sound like a whole collection of things and, and very over the top having all these different things going on, but it's actually, uh, it's not uncommon for um, intersex people to have other issues. We don't necessarily see being intersex in itself as uh, any kind of health problem because lots of people are healthy, but it does mean that there's a higher instance of disability. And then once you've got a disability, then, then you can have other complications with that. So yeah, um, that's, that's quite a lot to deal with. My sort of experience that I would say sort of stuck with me and to this day, yes, it still sticks with me, is uh, when I go to do that lovely test that all women like, which is the cervical smear test. It was my first time getting my, my smear test and at the start she asked you the questions, what protection do you use during sex? Um, and I said none and she like looked at me like, what do you mean none? Like, don't you use condoms? And I was like, oh no, because I'm gay. And she's like, 
so you never had sex with a man? I was like, N- no. He's like, what? Like, never? N- no. <laughs> you know, so it's a little bit like, wait, should I have? Like, am I in trouble for not doing it? Um, you know, as a 16-year-old girl, it's a little it's a, it's a little daunting to, to have, like, that was the first time I had that, like, question thrown in my face, by a professional, anyway. I was trying to access a service that was supposed to help me with my visual impairment, um, but through that process, I felt that I was continually undermined as a result of my disability, but I also got the strong impression that the person didn't like lesbians, basically. It was a man who, I think, was also maybe misogynistic, asked me a lot of intrusive questions about my partner that other people didn't ask later on when I was dealing with them instead. I remember when I was about 14 um, and I was out as a cis lesbian at the time and I was asked really invasive questions at the age of 14 if I had a girlfriend and if I had sex with them by my, by my psychotherapist. So that was like really uncomfortable. So that being LGBT in in child and adolescent mental health services has been a huge letdown and been like maybe lost all faith in mental health services altogether. I walked um, into one of the uh, um, service offices here and I said um, I would like to speak to uh, your deputy director and I named her by her first name. She looks at me once then she looks at me twice and then she says please wait over there. I didn't need to feel that way. You didn't need to look at me up and down twice. Because of how I looked, I felt like she was saying, well, you're, what are you doing here? There are all sorts of, of little problems that come about because um, I'm disabled and therefore I need extra help from some services, but that's compromised by people's attitudes to my sexuality and gender. For instance, I often have problems um, getting taxis because I need a taxi to get somewhere and the taxi will actually sometimes swerve away from the stop um, when it identifies me and the people I'm with as being LGBT. I've also had taxis refuse to take me because I'm using a wheelchair. I needed to have reconstruction surgery when I I moved here because I had my surgery in India and wasn't very great. So um, I decided not to go ahead with it eventually. But but when I first uh, raised that with the with the GP, I don't think they really understood uh, what it was that I was asking for. So instead of being sent to the right specialist, it was the gynecologist who saw me. So there was no acknowledgement of my my trans history as such. So I don't think that they, that was really dealt with appropriately. So then they had to re-refer me. So I think, um, I suppose the question it raises for me is that what happens to uh, immigrant, and that would include somebody who's a refugee asylum seeker, a uh, trans person who, who comes here, you know, how does the system then, uh, where they don't have a medical history, so to speak, in the UK, how does the system then uh, respond to them? My GP, for example, is brilliant. She acknowledges my partner. She takes account of my visual impairment. She has offered to come out to the reception and get me when I have an appointment and doesn't talk about my partner like she's my friend. I started my transition in, in Scotland because in Brazil it's a lot more complicated to do that. And in Brazil they don't allow you to change your name at, at, at the first thing. It's usually the last thing if they actually allow you have to go to court. So when I came to Scotland, I actually delayed my transition for a whole year because I didn't know if I could without changing my name. And then I realized that I actually could change my name for UK documents only and that didn't that without involving my Brazilian passport. So then when I did that, I had then my bank account and my university documents in the one name, the, my new male name, but my official Brazilian passport was issued under the, my, my old female name. I was allowed to get a visa in the UK stating my male name and, my, uh, and, and having my gender identity as male. When I went back to Brazil on holidays and then came back to the UK, I was really scared of going through the border because obviously my passport and my visa didn't match. I did have the DDPO linking both names and I knew that, it, that by law they had to accept me. But you know, you hear so much stories about uh, the border agencies being find, wanting to find an excuse not to let you back in that I was really, really scared that they would just see it as an excuse to send me back to Brazil and not 
allow me to come back to the UK because oh yes your documents are shady I don't I don't think you deserve to be here so I think for me the most difficult was having I was having to deal with the two sets of, of documents and I was having to explain to everyone having to come out to everyone I met in an official capacity my experience of accessing services especially mental health ones regarding my intersectionality as a trans person has actually been really difficult um, a lot of the time my the mental health services that I've been a accessing because of chronic mental health has been very focused towards my trans status which isn't to do with my mental health at all because um, I'm actually really comfortable being trans and being queer but I've had some really invasive questions about about being transgender when we're actually we're meant to be talking about past trauma and things like that um, which has been really difficult to deal with because it's made me feel a lot of distrust towards services that are meant to be helping me for, um, for quite a part of me that's quite ill. I remember using a counselling service. Um, they assumed a lot about my sexuality. They assumed a lot about um, my nationality. People assume that I don't s speak English. Having one arm doesn't help that scenario as well because within the same service, you know, people are now coming in and saying, let me get this for you instead of saying, hey, would you like some help with that? I've recently adopted a child and it was probably the world's longest pregnancy. Uh, it took us six years um, to go through the adoption process. So it wasn't so much my ethnic identity or my faith identity that baffled social workers or even my trans, uh, my being trans, but it was more my immigration status um, and the prejudice around, around that. And it was interesting how um, the adoption service, it was uh, the local council, how they viewed each of my um, identities as separate um, and not really as a whole. So I, I can see why they had to do that. They had to unpick each aspect of my life. So on a personal level, I think they were quite humane about my trans identity or my faith or, or what they thought my culture was because I don't think they really knew what it was even at the end of the whole process. But when it came to my immigration status, there was a, a lot of discrimination. Um, and immigration status is completely tied into your ethnic identity. They're not separate uh, because largely uh, it's people of color who are subject to immigration control. So I, I don't see how they could unpick it, although they thought that they were unpicking it. But when you experience it, it's not an unpicking because it is as much about from where you are and the country that you originate from and your right to be in the UK. A few years ago, um, I was trying to have a child, which is, is not actually possible for me as it turns out, but I was um, attending medical services for that. It felt like it was entirely geared to straight people, um, to people who you know fitted into their concept of how gender is supposed to work. And it wasn't just that there was no conception that somebody who wasn't female identified might be going through it. You know, I wasn't the only intersex person there. That became very apparent using those services. It's actually quite common for intersex people to, to end up looking at those services to see if it's possible for them, because some intersex people can have children. At the same time, nobody spoke about it. It was just hushed up. It was treated like, um, this is a collection of people who have something wrong with them. Nobody needs to feel bad about it. We won't talk about it. We'll focus on the positive, which is great. But at the same time, it felt like it was a dirty little secret. I've also had a couple of run-ins uh, with donating blood. So going to donate blood and the, the whole questionnaire that they give you, um, there's like the questions at the back, it's changed now, but before, uh, when they, if you're a woman, answer this question, if you're a man, answer this question. So I answered the woman question, which is, uh, is there any chance that you could be pregnant? So I take no, and then she do, does a little review with you. Um, so she goes to me, oh, you've, you filled out the wrong question. You're supposed to fill out the other one. I was like, why? I'm, I'm a woman. And she was like, oh, oh, I'm sorry. It was just, uh, you know, you're wearing a jumper. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. So then she goes down to it. It's like, we've ever been in, out of the country for more than six months. It all came out that I was uh, born in Zimbabwe. And she was just like, oh, Okay, just give me one second. So she goes away, talks to somebody, comes back, and she's like, "We're gonna have to do a, 
um, malaria test on you or something. And I was like, I've been in the country for five years. I haven't left in five years. We're going to have to do the test anyway. Okay, that's fine. So then they do the test and um, it takes another month or so before I actually get to go and donate blood. But, you know, if, I, if it wasn't for the fact that I really, really, really wanted to donate blood, then I would have never gone back. Bathrooms are a major, major issue. People see the white cane, they see me from the back and make an assumption because I am, like, I'm a cisgendered woman, but um, I'm not exactly gender normative. And so people assume that I'm a boy or a man walking into the women's toilets. And I am continually being dragged out of toilets because they see the cane and think that blind man has gone into the wrong toilet. But people freak out to the point where, at one point, in fact, twice, I've been followed into the toilets by men. Uh, one, in one case, a man followed me into the toilet and then tried to kick the door down. Presumably he thought that a man had maybe gone into the women's toilet to potentially assault a woman, which is a bit ironic because he was a man in the women's toilet potentially assaulting a woman. But that happens all the time. And I think that the white cane makes it happen more often. I don't have lower surgery. And for the Brazilian courts, that means that I can't really be a man in my birth certificate. My partner is also a trans guy and he's also an immigrant. He's from Hungary. Um, at the Neither of us has the gender recognition certificates, which means that for us to get a civil partnership, they look at our birth certificates. So we are both had female under our birth certificates. And so basically what ended up happening was that we were this clearly same-sex male couple getting a civil partnership that was going to be recorded as a lesbian civil partnership. The register was quite nice about it and, under, and understanding and at, at least that part went smoothly. We were able to opt not to make the vowels, but we were told that if we um, wanted to say something to each other, we would have to use the names in our birth certificate. So I would have to call my partner female. Well, I would have to use his old female name for it. So that, that was one of the reasons we opted not to say anything and just sign the papers. Generally, I've had um, good experiences. I'm, I'm, I remember years ago, I went to the doctor and, the, and I'm basically, I'm, I'm, he saw my wedding band and then the question was, oh, how's your wife? And I'm like, well, actually, I'm not married, I have a partner and I'm gay. He says, oh, you don't look gay. And I'm like, well, then what is gay supposed to kind of look like? Because I have had doctors in the past talk about my partner as though she is my friend or in one case <laughs> I refer to my partner as my sister. When you've got a disability that impacts on your life every single day it can chip away your confidence. There's a drip drip effect, it's, it's not nice and so there's a thing of trying to be more confident, trying to pretend it's not happening. And then when you're access, trying to access a service, you have to really make yourself vulnerable and talk about um, needing help, which isn't particularly empowering, particularly when you don't feel you can complain because you're worried about complaining and losing even more access to that service. It's difficult because I need um, hospital services a lot and I need to see doctors and sometimes I have had issues with discrimination there. I have to see multiple people all the time. I sometimes have carers around to the house, um, district nurses, that kind of thing. And there's always that question that there is when you're ever in a vulnerable situation and you don't know how somebody's going to react. Is it safe to come out? And then I have to do it again the next time and the next time. I've also had hassle at things like, you know, going to, to pride parades, even because if I go along um, with a male partner or even just with a male carer, then some people act like, you're not supposed to be here. And it's like, excuse me, you know, I'm here as an intersex person, as a non-binary person, as a bisexual person. I shouldn't have to explain away the fact that I'm there with a man. Being in LGBT spaces themselves can make me feel quite uncomfortable because as a trans person I feel like I'm invisible even in spaces that are meant to be for me because they have the T on the end but really it just feels like they're for cis people um, and that can be really uncomfortable as well um, because you know, the spaces you're meant to turn to sometimes just aren't there even within trans spaces being non-binary or also being queer at the same time as being trans can be a like a huge thing as well because there are certain people that um, that can be really rude towards um, other aspects of your identity that they might not be very comfortable with just because you're in a certain space. 
so even in, in services that are geared to LGBT people, it can be difficult. And as a disabled person, it's difficult because an awful lot of LGBT spaces are not wheelchair accessible because it's a small community. Um, there are issues around generating enough money to keep clubs running and bars and that kind of thing. So most of them are upstairs because those are the cheaper venues and then I can't get into them. So I have nowhere to go really that, that's suitable like that. There are lots of ways that services can help. I think one of the problems that commonly comes up is that people think they're catering to a specific kind of person with a specific service. So if, for instance, I go to get medical help, everybody's focusing on me being a disabled person and an ill person, and it really helps if there is something there that says, you know, we are friendly to LGBT people, whatever else, just so that I know that that support is available or that I can at least reference that if I have to make a complaint or something like that. If a service is a more personal centred than a kind of outcome focus, right? You, you want to kind of build up relationship and with, and with that public facing person over a period of months and years. I think services could improve quite simply by not making assumptions about anyone. It's the, it's the assumptions, it's the assumptions that, 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 that bothers me the most. Most of the times people won't just come to your doors and say, oh, hello, I'm James, I'm bi, I'm trans, and I'm an immigrant. Easiest way for you to know the whole dimension is for you to show this accommodating and welcoming attitude. Then they will trust you quicker. But I think if you're going to be working in services, then you need to be a little bit more educated, whether that means you're going out to get educated yourself, about the people you're going to be working with or if it means there's like training that your particular organisation can put on. Ultimately it's about raising awareness um, in, in certain services and having special awareness training towards people with, who do have intersectional identities and how to handle that and how to be as accepting and supportive as possible towards the things they're meant to be dealing with at the same time as not undermining other things they might be going through. Asking polite and appropriate questions, asking when you need to know rather than asking because you want to know. I sort of think it's around um, what are the gaps in their knowledge, who I can they work with, collaborate with. Within big organisations, within NUS or in the, within the university, there's a lot of thinking about investing a lot of money that you need into uh, accessibility, but always forgetting to ask the person the people, you know, people are different. People know that they're different and they have different needs. It's really just about people realising that people don't just have one category that, that sums up everything they are. When people are thinking about setting up an LGBT event, if I know that it can also be accessible for me physically, um, that's really helpful. I think one of the main things and one of the easiest as well is to have something like a code of conduct that's very easily displayed in the kind of entrance area, reception area, where both service users and the staff can see it and have this service, this code of conduct list all protected characteristics saying we don't tolerate discrimination based of gender identity, sexual orientation, race, religion, all of them have it very clearly and very visible. Good going out to cultural events, social events, that's black and queer, just to get a sense of how are people actually function, live and breathe and move in the world, integrate um, concepts and practices around kind of inclusion, diversity, within kind of um, every kind of part of um, and their services normally. And the person in front of you might not have in, in, impact upon um, some of their policies that's going through. And, um, and um, I think kind of sometimes the work don't happen because it's actually systemic. That's, that's where a lot of the work needs to be done. I suppose the most important thing in all my experiences of, of the public services or even other services that I might use is that they see me as a person. That really, you know, remembering that and acting on that is really what services need to do to improve. I think it happens on an individual basis, but I'm not quite convinced it happens in a, in a structural way. So I think that that's really one thing that, th that they need to do, that there has to be a, a bigger dialogue within services about how they will respond to, respond to people's um, diverse needs.